I was asked yesterday to share some words on the portion of this week, so I need some notes because it was a last minute. But in the process, something amazing happened, which I'll get to in a, min in a minute. But one of the things Rabbi Isaac Lurie, the Ari, says about this portion is that Jacob, Yaakov's name, he has three names. One is Jacob, one is Yaakov. One is Jacob or Yaakov spelled with a vav for the o and Yaakov. And one name is Israel, Yisrael. And the Ari explains that the reason for the three names are Jacob, Yaakov, without the Vav, refers to the lowest level of our soul, the nefesh, the animal instinct, survival, lowest level. Yaakov with a Vav refers to the Ruach, the next level of soul. And the name <clears throat> Yisrael, Israel, refers to the neshama, the highest level of soul. And the Uri goes on to explain that the nefesh, Yaakov, without the vav, the lowest level, corresponds to our liver. And the liver is where the Zohar tells us the evil inclination exists. You know, all of our negative urges and impulses and reactive behavior emanate from the liver. And when we restrict our reactive behavior, when we resist it, uh, uh, the liver produces good cholesterol and good health and everything. And when we don't, when we listen to the uh, negative side, the liver literally takes away the... What did I just say? When we don't listen, the liver absorbs the negative fats and negative cholesterol and puts out pure fats for healing and health. Now, the re says, the second level of soul, the ruach, corresponds to the heart. And Israel, Jacob's name, Yisrael, corresponds to the brain. So we have the liver, the heart, and the brain. Now in Hebrew, if you take the first letter of the word for liver, heart, and brain, you get the word melech, which is king. So we become a king over our physical body, ruling over our reactive nature, ruling over the ego. And of course, the brain, neshama, doesn't refer to the physical brain. It refers to a state of consciousness. As we know in Kabbalah, in fact, the land of Israel does not refer to a state called Israel. It refers to a state of consciousness, which is about love thy neighbor. And when we reach a critical mass of people in the world who attain that level of Israel, that state of consciousness of love that neighbor, then the land of Israel will emanate peace to the entire world. Until we reach that critical mass, we have what we have seen for the last 2,000 years, you know, pain and sorrow coming from the land of Israel and for the rest of the world. So what does that mean? We're a king. We achieve that level of Israel, that consciousness, our liver, our heart to our brain. What does that really mean? So I lecture maybe once, twice a year. I get the opportunity to you know, share some words on Shabbat. And this week, um, on, I think it was Monday, I was thinking about Michael Berg's lecture last week. And it was very familiar to me. So I went into my notes to see, when was the last time I gave a lecture? And it was last week's portion. And I looked at my notes and I watched the video and it was all about the Rav's teaching about space. I don't know how many people were here when I gave that lecture. I don't know how many people here read the Rav's Nano book. If you haven't read the Rav's Nano book, I urge you to read it three, four times. I just spoke to a physicist yesterday, by the way, who told me he read the book five times. He was so amazed by the book. But basically, it was all about how space in our lives is what causes death. And I'm going to talk about quickly what it means, but what I found insane is that they asked me to speak today, which is exactly the next portion from last week, and, and in the Torah, every portion has white parchment between each portion. So for the 52 weeks of the year, when, you know, Bereish, you know, when the Bereshit ends, when Noah ends, each portion ends, there's white parchment separating the portions, except this week. 
last week's Vayigash and this week's Vayechi has no space. So to me, that was profound. I mean, it reminds me of the Rav saying, I was walking with the Rav last year. And we're walking, I'm saying to the Rav, Rav, isn't it amazing how Karen's traveling the whole world, Yehuda's traveling the whole world, visiting tzaddikim that have never been visited in, in, in history, the way he's doing it with such frequency and all over the world because they couldn't travel like that, you know, centuries ago. And the Rav smiled at me and said, just don't forget who's behind the scenes running everything. <laughs> so I feel that the Rav, I'm finishing off last year's lecture, which is the exact next portion, to finish off the Rav's teaching to share with you what the Rav is you know, teaching us about space. And it just so happens that this week, I'm, go I'm going in February, uh, February 5th to NASA, to the Goddard Space Flight Center near Washington, to give a lecture on the Rubs Nano book for about a hundred physicists. <laughs> Which is insane because now a Zohar is going to walk into NASA. In fact, in, in, they're preparing about, a, I think, 500 mini Zohars with NASA's name stamped on the Zohar, which is amazing. And they're bringing the Rubs Nano book. And we're bringing a power of Kabbalah books to, you know, to distribute it as, as, as many as we can. So anyways, in preparation for that lecture, I was reviewing my notes and I came across something that absolutely blew my mind that was in front of my face for 23 years and I only understood it this week. And it totally connects to the lecture we did last year in the Rubs Nano book on space and it connects to today. So and there's no space between... between Vayechi and Vayigash, and here I am a year later, but the whole year later is all an illusion, as we're going to see, the space. So, science, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, not debated, a plain fact. Science tells us, and we all have heard this, I'm sure, time is an illusion. And we're also told that space and time are connected. It's called the space-time continuum. So space-time. Everybody heard the term space-time, right? Science tells us that, you know, as we pick up in speed, time slows down and space contracts. Science tells us that if we can approach the speed of light, time will reduce to almost nil, and if we could theoretically achieve the speed of light, time would stand still. There'd be no more time. We can't reach the speed of light because we have physicality, we have mass. Even an electron, an atom, a proton, a neutron, even their constituent components, quarks and leptons, all the subatomic particles, don't worry if you don't know what they are, but even they have some measure of mass. So we can't achieve the speed of light. But if we could, says Einstein's theory of relativity, time would absolutely stand still. Hold that thought. So when I shared the Rav's teachings on, on Vayigash, I, I hope you don't mind, I just want to review it. Every time I hear it, I learn more, and I'll just give you the condensed version. Basically, what I said was also a scientific fact. Atoms are immortal. Atoms never die. There is no death in this universe. It doesn't exist. We are all made of atoms. If we're made of atoms, and atoms never die. They're 15 billion years old since the moment they were created in the Big Bang. If atoms are immortal and we're made of atoms, why do we die? And the analogy I gave was Lego, Lego building blocks. If you take Lego building blocks and you create a Lego man, wow, there's, there's the Lego man. But if I take him apart and space comes between the pieces because it's now disassembled, Lego man disappears but the individual pieces are still with us. So what disappears, not dies, what disappears is the form. Everybody with me? Okay. So the individual parts are immortal, but the form is not. Now, if you look at the Kabbalist commentary throughout history on this portion, 
and the Rav's commentary, which I have his notes right here, the Rav says, and all Kabbalists in history say, Jacob didn't die. And the Torah doesn't use the word today that Jacob died. The word is expired. So there's Kabbalists throughout history. If you go back you know, 300 years, 500 years, back to even Rashi, they all, they all say Jacob didn't die. The word is expire. But nobody in history, except for the Rav, tells us how this applies to our life. What does that mean, Jacob didn't die? Why do we care? And how can I use that in my own life so that we can end death? So the secret to immortality is Jacob. And that's why there's no space between last week's portion and this week's portion, because it's space that causes death. If you have a picture puzzle, and on that beautiful picture puzzle is painted the word immortality, if I inject space into that picture puzzle and it comes apart, the word immortality is gone. If we can suck out all the space, the puzzle comes back together again, and boom, there's immortality. Everybody with me? Okay. So the key is to remove space. One last point from last year, and this is the most important point, according to Rav Ashlag, you will ever learn in Kabbalah. Where does space come from? That's the bottom line. Where does space come from? And Rabbi Ashlag says, there is a law called the law of repulsion. Meaning, in the spiritual realm, in true reality, when things are different, they repel. And in that repulsion, if, my, if I have an apple and an orange, they repel. If I have an apple and an apple, they're one, because they're the same. But if, an apple, if I have an apple and an orange, they repel. And in between is space. Everybody with me? That's where space comes from. So the light is a sharing force. We are a receiving force. We're opposite. So we're in an opposite reality. We are so far distant from the light because of our opposite nature. We are in an opposite reality. And the simple analogy the Rav uses in the nano book is if you stand in front of a mirror and you move your left hand, what hand moves in the mirror? The right hand. So, if you take this analogy one step further, if God sends forth love, what do we experience if we're in the mirror? Hate. But it's an illusion, because the whole mirror is an illusion. When you stand in front of a mirror, you think there's two of you. I'm here and I'm in the mirror. But there's really only one of you, right? The second you is an illusion. That's what they mean by this world is an illusion. But we're in this world because we are creatures who receive who take, who desire. That's why we're in this reality. So if God sends forth a kiss, we get a punch in the mouth. If God sends forth immortality, we experience death. If God is a realm of timelessness, in the mirror, it's time. If the light is a realm of zero motion, just infinite unity, then in the mirror, we have motion and disunity. Everybody with me? So the whole problem is that we receive, we take, we react. And this is why the vessel shattered into pieces. This is why we're all here. Because if the vessel was one whole soul and just received, there's no way home. But if the vessel shatters into pieces, we can now imitate, emulate, copy the light, which is to share. Now I have someone to share with. As soon as I share with somebody, I'm like the light, boom, I go back home. Not physically, blessing the light comes to my life. So we're here for 6,000 years to slowly transform different aspects of our consciousness from receiving into receiving for the sake of sharing. So anywhere in your life where we have true blessing, it means we've already corrected that part of our consciousness. Therefore, we've achieved oneness with the light and we have a blessing in our life, thank God. And wherever we're experiencing chaos in our life, it means that's the part of our consciousness that is still receiving and therefore is experiencing an opposite reality. 
So we think Jacob died because we're in the mirror. Outside the mirror, Jacob's still here. Outside the mirror, all our loved ones are still here. So here's what I found out this week in preparation for my lecture to, at NASA. Light from the sun. Light from these, these lights in the room. Emanate towards us, and then we absorb that light with our eyes. We see the light. We feel the light. Physics tells us that light is carried through a, a particle called a photon. Okay? So just think of photon as a synonym for light. Okay? So photons, you know, when the sun is shining its rays upon the earth, it's photons that are falling upon the earth. When you see a star that's, you know, a billion light years away in a telescope, you're looking at the photons of light that have reached us. From our perspective, because we're in the mirror where there's time, and because we have physicality, we think it took 13, let's say, billion years for that photon to reach our Earth from that distant galaxy 13 billion light years away. From our perspective, it did take that long. But Einstein and every physicist on Earth will tell you, from the photon's perspective, it is here instantly. Because a photon is the only particle in this universe that has no mass, no physicality. An electron has some portion of mass, atoms have some mass, obviously we have physicality, but a photon is massless, and a photon is the only particle in the universe that travels at the speed of light, and therefore time stands still. So as soon as it leaves a star 10 billion years from now, I'm sorry, 10 billion light years away, it's here instantly. Not only that, but from the photon's perspective, space has also disappeared because space and time are connected. So the photon, not only is it here on Earth, it's on Mars, and it's all over the entire universe at once. Mind-boggling. There's no time, there's no space for a photon. It's everywhere at once. This is exactly what Rabbi Isaac Luria said when he said the light is simple, it fills all reality, and only from the vessel's perspective, we're the vessel, only from our perspective, because we're receivers and we're in the mirror, do we think there's time, space, and motion. But from the, and we're talking physicality, from the light's perspective, from photon, from sunlight, it's everywhere at once. So this is why science is wasting their time trying to build a spaceship that can go as fast as the speed of light, you know, so then we can go back in time, forward in time. No. We're in the mirror. Listen carefully. There is no motion. You can't say the light has speed. What we're seeing in the mirror is light speed. But what's really happening outside the mirror is the opposite, which means there's no speed. Light is everywhere. It's not about achieving the speed of light. It's about achieving the consciousness of the light, which is massless, no physicality. What does that really mean practically? No desire to receive. The moment we get rid of our desire to receive, we'll be like the light. We'll be everywhere at once. That is Mashiach. That is paradise. Let me make it even simpler. The Messiah, the world of immortality, is already here. The problem is we have to wait. According to the Hebrew calendar, anybody know? We're 200 and how many years away are we? Anybody know? 225? I don't know, about 200 some odd years away before this world ends and the Messiah is here. That's the longest it can take. So it's not here right now and it's 10 minutes away or it could be 10 months from now or it could be, God forbid, the whole 200 years we have to wait for it. The problem is time. We have to wait. Each one of us is perfectly healthy in the future. Each one of us are reunited with our loved ones in the future. The problem is the idea of future. If we can get rid of time, if we can get rid of space, it's here now. The problem is time. 
How do you get rid of time? Get rid of the ego. This is why we're here. Now, when we say get rid of the ego, Rabbi Ashok says we're not here to really get rid of the ego. We don't have that power. All we have to do is recognize the ego. Just admit it. And whatever you bring to the table today, in terms of recognizing our ego, whatever we did this last week where we were reactive, angry, jealous, envious, all the things we can remember when we read this Torah, we're cleansed. If we come to be holy and righteous, we get nothing. If we come with our ugliest traits, you know, we're we're, we're bearing our soul, our ugliest traits, we cleanse them. So the way we can remove time from this universe so we can bring the future to the present is if we can have 10 people, say the Kabbalists, just 10 people who can affect that transformation, we shift the whole consciousness of the world, then we all have that photon consciousness. No mass, meaning no ego. There's no influence of the ego. You see, if you do an action, like me lecturing today, let's say, I'm sitting there waiting to come up here, and I said, I got an ego. And, you know, I hope I speak good, and I hope everybody likes me today, and I hope it sounds freaking amazing. And as long as I admit my ego to myself, you can't get me. It's not, I'm not supposed to come up here, I have no ego, I'm humble, I'm, I'm such a nice person. No, I'm a maniac, pig, selfish person. As long as I see it, it can't touch me. So we just have to admit it, not get rid of it, Rabbi Ashak says. Admit it. And as long as your eye is on your ego while your eye is on the audience, as long as your eye is on your ego when you're at work, when you're talking to people, whatever you're doing, as long as you constantly be in two places at the same time, that is called transformation. If 10 people can do that all day long, That will bring the Messiah. That will change the conscience of the world where we're like photons. We're just sharing. Sharing means my eyes are on the ego. It's not not interfering. This is why denial is the worst thing we can do. I deny. It's not my ego. How stupid. It's not. It is my ego. What am I defending my ego for? So the Rav says that this portion is the summation of the entire book of Breshit. So it's the seed of the entire year, because Breshit is the seed of the entire year. And it's the seed and essence of the entire book of Breshit. That's what we get today. And because there's no space between last week and this week, we get the power of removing space from every part of our life. Just have to sit there today and think about all the negative things that we've done, that we have, that we're most embarrassed about, and let the light and let the spaceless Torah do the rest. And finally... We say, it's because it's, it's the last portion, we say, chazak, chazak, chazak. The Rav explained that the numerical value of chazak is 115. We say it three times because right, left, central, which is the power of Jacob. And when you say it three times, the numerical value is 345, which is the numerical value of Moses' name, Moshe, and the Memhe Shin. So we can get infinite healing, the whole power of the Torah through the teachings of Moses. And through Jacob, Yaakov, who's the central column. What's the central column? Resistance. Just see your ego, resist, and we can bring the power of immortality to our life. Shabbat Shalom.